I don't. I think we were having too much fun just jabbering away in here to hear the bell ring, letting us know that it is time to worship. But it is time. That bell has been rung, and here we are. So glad to have you here with us this Sunday morning. As we always do, it is right and good to start off our time of worship hearing directly from God's word. And so let the church be called to worship this morning out of the 100th Psalm. Psalm 100 says this, and it's an appropriate one for our worship service. Shout to joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our call to worship this morning. And this is the God to whom we have been called to worship. So let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Father, Lord, we are indeed your sheep in your pasture. And we are grateful for it because there is no greater shepherd than you. So, Lord, as we gather in this place to worship you this morning, may your spirit be working in our hearts, inclining us fully towards you. May there not be a single ounce of our body, not a single cell that isn't focused on giving you all glory, honor, and praise, because you are God and you are good. And so we thank you for this Sunday morning. We thank you for your son who gave us life through his death. And we thank you for your love that abounds forever. May we worship you wholly and completely this day. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. All right. We have begun with a word from the Lord, a word of prayer to the Lord, and now something about a joyful noise to the Lord.
take your seats if you would. Again, welcome to worship this morning on this, the most glorious Sunday of all summer. And what a stark contrast to last Sunday, my goodness. We were joking about needing to take a boat to get here last Sunday, and that didn't mean from the mainland to here. That meant getting down the street. <laughs> it was remarkable, and I was also reminded that for the more than a year that we were worshiping outdoors due to COVID, there were only two Sundays during that time where it actually rained during the time of the service. And one of those was a fairly gentle rain at that. And so um, God looking out for us. But with this day, my goodness, what a gorgeous day to worship. And I'm glad that you're here this morning. I don't have many announcements. The, the first I'd like to make is if you have one of these in your pocket, if you would please, at the very least, turn it to the silent mode so that it doesn't ring during service. Um, if you're feeling really brave, you can even, dare I say, turn the thing off for an hour of worship. I'll leave that in your hands. Um, for those of you that don't know, there are restrooms that you can get to either through this door or just go down the ramp outside and they're right behind the church. Important thing for people to know about. Um, next, this upcoming week, um, some of you may remember Josh and Brenda Lee Casey who were here a couple of years ago as they were preparing to move to Spain to embark on mission work. It's kind of remarkable to think that missionaries need to be planted in Europe, but that is what they need to do. And so they had located one of the least Christian cities in Spain and went and moved there. And they're going to be here on the island this upcoming week, just having a time of vacation and getting ready to go back. Uh, so I suspect we'll get a little bit of an update from them next Sunday, just about how their efforts have been going. But if you happen to see them, and have no idea who they are, well, then you'll be forgiven for not knowing who they are. But hopefully by the time next Sunday rolls around, you will and can greet them and at least encourage them because it is uh, a wonderful thing when you are willing to be the feet of Christ, but sometimes it takes you to places where nobody else knows it. And we need to encourage him while we can. So <clears throat> with that in mind, are there any other announcements that we need to make for the community from the congregation today? All right, and in that instance, as we move along, we've got a time of fellowship, passing the peace, but because we're here stuck together on an island without a bridge, I want to encourage you to get up out of your seats this time. Find somebody that you don't know, and for some of you, I know that'll be really easy, but for some of you, <clears throat> just look around. Find a face that you're not familiar with. Get up out of your seats, grab a hand, get to know a name, break down some of these walls that keep us from truly worshiping in fellowship with one another. Get to know one another. Take a couple minutes if you would, please.
All right, if I can get you to come on back to your seats, please. All right. So, I know I didn't warn you beforehand, but if I were to take an impromptu quiz right now and ask somebody to raise their hand and tell me the name of somebody they just met that they didn't know before. How would we do? Uh, yeah, I, who'd you meet? Uh, I met Dave and Bob. Right, I got that right. All right. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Well, they decided to stay here and worship with us. Yeah. All right, well, that's a pretty good representation. We had this side of the church. We had this side of the church. We're more united as a congregation as a result. Wonderful. Thank you for that. So, Kathy, clearly people were warming up their vocal cords even more during that that's time great. of fellowship. So, how are we going to make use of it? Number 350, 350. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. We're going to sing the first, second, and fourth verses, so please stand when you have it. seats. Now, for those of you who aren't accustomed to worshiping with us here at church, you'll probably be familiar with the time in, in your home church worship service where they have prayer requests and praise reports and testimonies. And it may be as simple as the pastor or rector or father reading through a list of prayers that have been gathered beforehand. But we do things differently here because we're defusty and <coughs> life's different over here. And so this is an invitation to you to lift up before us prayer requests or praise reports, give testimonies of how God is working in your life. 
And I want you to understand that it's so easy for me to stand up here and give a sermon and think it's the greatest sermon I've ever given. But the reality is most of you will leave here and will have, by the time your foot hit the parking lot, forgotten what I preached on. But prayer requests are an invitation for us to weave into our own lives love for our neighbor, for our brother and sister that we're worshiping with. It's the opportunity to take something out from this church and carry it with you for the rest of the week. And so I build it up because it's an important time for us. It's how we really strengthen the bonds of fellowship with each other. It's how we really show that we love our neighbor as ourselves. And as the song goes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. And if we're not praying for each other, then what are we doing? And so this is your time. Prayer requests, praise reports, testimonies. How can we be as Christ to each other? Anne. The fact that I'm here shows that for, for those of you who were praying for me last week for my safety and my trip to Baltimore and back, um, it, those prayers were answered. So I thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for praying. It was entirely um, issue free. All my flight left on time and arrived early. And all of my teammates wore masks. Amen. Other prayer requests, praise reports, testimonies. How are we doing? Russ. Um, three. Uh, praise report. Jeannie and I this week celebrated our 50th anniversary. Perfect place to end that week. Um, request. She's got a pretty bad sciatic issue going on right now. So I want to pray for Jeannie's healing. And we also have with us our uh, son and his wife and two children. And one of the boys is 15 now. He's autistic. And he has a lot of struggles. So we want to pray for a tighter knit family and understanding and how to, how to help him through the world. Sally? Yes, I always want to give praise. Dennis, I saw your hand back there. Yes. I'd like to uh, have y'all pray for Cairo's prison ministry that we go back into uh, prison un unhindered by uh, new regulations or whatever. And we go pray for our uh, visit in November to Coastal State Prison. And uh, so we lift up a lot of people as we go in. We pray for the 42 inmates that get to participate in the Cairo prison ministry experience. Okay. I see a hand. Yep. Yes. Kathy? Safe travels for John and Paula Hinchy. Keep a drug test to their new RV. Jealous? 
Others? John? And may Jesus bring healing to all and give us direction. Others? Yes. Others? Catherine. I leave for college on Wednesday, so this is how I stay busy and feel alive. <laughs> so travel nursing and health prep can move in process so smoothly, and that I do all my taxes. Amen. 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 And a little panic is good. <laughs> Other, and I don't want to miss out on anybody. All right. Looks like we got it. So, again, for those of you who aren't accustomed to worshiping with us, we are a church that assigns homework, and this is it. We're going to go through this list of prayers. I'm going to lead us in corporate prayer, and I invite you to be praying along. But I also want you to allow the Holy Spirit to do his thing. So that while we are praying through this list of prayers, as the Holy Spirit convicts you of one of these prayer requests and he's going to do it if you are praying attentively he is going to call your attention to at least one of these prayer requests make it yours write it down put it in your phone whatever it takes but when you have your quiet time with the lord during the rest of this week as you were lifting up your own petitions include this other prayer request as well as i mentioned in the build-up to all of this it is a simple act of loving each other and so lifting them up in prayer will do that and you get bonus points later on in the week if you see the person whose prayer you have been lifting up and ask them about things i promise you the smile that comes across their face from knowing that you cared enough to be in prayer for them will be all the bonus you need so with that having been said let us go to the lord as his church gracious father Lord, your love is amazing and it knows no bounds. And so we shouldn't be surprised that you invite us to come before you as your people, to lift up that which burdens our heart, that which concerns our mind, because we know that we can trust you as God Almighty. And so, Father, as your people, we come before you this morning and we want to give you praise for, for delivering Anne up and back, allowing her to have time with her sister and, and being safe in those travels. We want to give praise, Father, for a 50th anniversary celebration because you were glorified in marriages that you have been that third strand that keeps them woven together. And so I am so grateful for Russ and Jeannie and their faithfulness to each other and to you and the model that their marriage provides for their family. We pray that Jeannie's sciatic issue would be relieved at your hand, Father. And we pray for their grandson and whose autism Help their family to understand how best to navigate that difficulty to work because you brought that in for a reason. And so they just help them to deal with it. Help them to understand how you were glorified in all creation. Lord, we lift up to you with great praise, a great grandchild born on Sally's birthday. What a wonderful gift. And we pray for your blessings upon that child upon the family, that they would be able to raise this child up in the ways of the Lord so that he will not depart from it. We also ask for your blessing upon all who call to Fusky home and all who have chosen to visit here. May they find your peace and your presence in a way that might not be seen in other places. And they, may they be drawn to you. We lift up to you a nephew with COVID and pray that you would provide healing for him just as we give you praise for Tretz's healing and her restoration for her recovery and for being here. And we just pray that you would grant her patience to allow herself to fully heal also. 
Lord, we want to lift up to the Kairos prison ministry. And as they prepare for their visit to Coastal States Prison in November, Lord, we pray that, that your spirit would be softening the hearts of the inmates who get to participate, just as we pray that your spirit would be stealing the minds of those who are going to go in and make that visit. May they go in armed with the knowledge of you, Father, but also with your heart for the lost so that they can be effective witnesses. Father, we want to lift up to you two co-workers, expecting moms, one who was due earlier this week and one who's due soon. And we just pray that your blessing would be upon mother and children, that they would be brought into this world with, with laughter, with tears of joy, healthy moms and children both. Father, we pray that you would be with John and Paulette in their travels. Bless them and bring them back safely to us. We pray that you, Jesus, would bring upon healing and direction to a world with soon too many dark places. And Father, we want to lift up to you, Claire, someone who is battling darkness. Father, would you, with your Holy Spirit, pour out light upon her, soften her heart, help her to know you and your love and your mercy, and deliver her from the evil that is working in her life so that there might be reconciliation. And Father, I want to lift up to you, Catherine. We are so grateful that she's been a part of this church, and I just pray that as she prepares to head off for school, that that, that would be a smooth transition, that travel mercies would be upon us, that we would get her moved in, and that you would bless her in her new place of living. Lord, there are other prayer requests in the hearts and minds of your people gathered here today but we know that your Holy Spirit has already sought them out from our depths and carried them before you. So we trust that you will do whatever is best and right for each and every one of us. And we thank you, Father. In the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right. Well, as we continue along in our worship service, um, we've reached the time for our scripture reading, and I have asked Anne to come on up and read to us from the 21st chapter of John's Gospel. The reading today is from John chapter 21, verses 15 through 22. 21, 15 through 22. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. The word of the Lord. Okay, well... We have reached a time in our worship service for our offering. And Dennis, can I call on you to help out with the offering? And, and Bill, if you would. These gentlemen are preparing to pass a plate around for the traditional offering at a church where you may or may not be reaching into your wallet to throw something into a plate. But while they are doing that, we're going to have a couple of ladies pour out a different kind of offering. And as they do that, I am praying two things happen. One, that your time of worship today will be enriched by the blessing that they are pouring out. 
but secondly, that you will be inspired to realize that the greatest gifts that you have to offer God's kingdom are not what you're about to try to put into a plate because they won't fit. There are gifts that weren't designed to be put into a plate, but they are gifts that were designed to be poured out to benefit his kingdom so that his kingdom can be enriched just as you are about to be enriched as well. Ladies and gentlemen. Jesus is the rock. And I'm weary in that world. Jesus is a rock. And I'm weary in that world. Jesus is a rock. And I'm weary in that Shouting in a time of song. Oh, Jesus is a rock. And as we prepare for this message that we're about to hear, I would invite you also, once again, just bow your heads in prayer with me, if you would, please. Father, Lord, if you would, please empty me of myself and get me out of the way so that the words that are about to be proclaimed are yours and not mine. Father, would your spirit also be working through all of our minds so that we would hear this message as you intend for it to be heard and understood. Lord, please, please, Father, be working in our hearts, setting our hearts on fire with a love for your Son, Jesus Christ, for it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> this reading for today that Anne gave us a little bit ago has a couple of components to it that I really, really enjoy. First is the Apostle Peter is a prominent figure in it. I find Peter despite the fact that he is this rock of the church, thought of sometimes as the first pope, to be this, this magical, bigger-than-life figure. But the reality is the Peter that we get in Scripture is a truly relatable man. He is the man who had enough faith to get out of a boat and walk on water, but at the same time then look around, get distracted by life, and start sinking. He is the same man who had enough faith to proclaim, Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. But then deny him three times. He is the same man who was able to look at the one who came to save us all and had the temerity to think that he could save him by denying him an opportunity to go to the cross. He's sometimes called the apostle with his foot in his mouth. And in him, I find a very relatable man, one who proclaims faith, but at the same time struggles to live it out. He's a real guy. And so I enjoy the Apostle Peter. He gives us lessons when he falters. And we're going to get one of those lessons today. But I also love the fact that this is in John's Gospel. For those of you that have spent much time talking with me about things theological, you know that John's Gospel is perhaps my favorite book in the Bible, that puts me in really good company because most people would proclaim that John's Gospel is among their top two or three favorite books in the Bible, and it is the book that I always tell newcomers to faith to start with when trying to understand about the importance of the Bible and who Christ is. We have a men's book club that we decided one month that we were just going to read the book of John and study that because all of our discussions kept coming back to it. So John's Gospel 
has a big place in my heart as a follower of Christ. And in this 21st chapter, we see a wonderful pairing of the Apostle Peter in the context of John's gospel. And so this is big. This is towards the end of Jesus' time on earth. He has been crucified, died, and risen again. And this is his resurrected self that the apostles are now encountering. There's a group of seven led by Peter. It's not all the apostles. The scriptures don't give us enough to know whether or not it was all, all seven apostles. It indicates maybe that two of those folks who were fishing with Peter were disciples. But they've gone off sometime in that time between when Christ has been to them again and when they have their final encounter with the resurrected Lord, and they've decided to go fishing. And off they go into the familiar waters of the Sea of Galilee. And they're out there fishing, and they do their fishing at night because Peter, as a fisherman, knows that's when you catch your fish. And alas, their nets are empty. But as they approach the shore, they see a figure over there, and he says, did you catch anything? And they have to admit, no, it wasn't a very fruitful time. And he says, well, just throw your nets over the right side of the boat. They've heard this before. And so they do. They go ahead and they throw their empty nets out of their empty boat over the side of the waters. And lo and behold, they fill with fish. And that seems to make things just sort of click in their minds. That's Jesus on the shore. And so Peter, in his enthusiasm, just puts on his outer cloak, dives in the water, swims to the beach so that he can get back up close and personal with Jesus. By the way, leaving the rest of the guys to figure out how to get the boat in. It's only when Jesus says, hey, do you have any fish for breakfast? That Peter's, oh, yeah, it's out there. So he goes back to the boat, helps them get everything to the shore, and they have this wonderful feast. But Jesus needs to spend some time with Peter because when Peter denied him three times, there was damage done that needed to be healed. Not within Jesus, but within Peter. And sometimes healing is painful. And so you can almost see Peter walking sort of sheepishly with Jesus as they're going down the beach. And Jesus three times says, do you love me? And he puts up with it. But by the time Jesus asks the third time, the text tells us that it grieved Peter. He said, you know I love you. Why would you have to ask me three times? Well, because I denied you three times. But Peter is hurt. At the same time, he's being healed by Jesus. But in his hurt and in his pain, he does something that's very relatable, once again, to us. He looks back at this guy who identifies himself as the apostle whom Jesus loved. There's, there's no berating going on with him. He's the guy who rested his head on Jesus' bosom at the last dinner. And he looks back at this guy. And he says, well, after Jesus says, you got to follow me. And as you get older, Peter, you're going to be led where you don't want to go. Now, we can interpret that in one of two ways. It could mean that as your arms are stretched out, being led where you don't want to go, it could mean that that's him saying his, your hands are going to be nailed to a cross. But it could just simply be that you're not going to be in control of your destiny, that there are going to be some people who are going to have you captive, and they are going to be the ones that will dictate how your life ends. Either one of those interpretations, by the way, isn't something that would make me really happy, knowing how my life was going to end either in captivity or stretched out on, on the cross. I wouldn't be jumping for joy. And Peter, hearing these words out of Jesus' mouth, already hurting from being asked a third time whether or not he loves him, to then be told, oh, by the way, your end here isn't going to be so good. Peter looks at John over his what about him? I love Peter. He shows us human nature. When we are hurting, we want to know that we're not the only ones that are going to be hurting. I'm following you faithfully, and you're telling me it's not going to end well. Please tell me that the suffering is going to be with him too. And it's funny. If we look in Scripture... We can see how we can get expectations about what life should be like for people who follow the Lord. Daniel, Old Testament Daniel, a man who was an exile. 
the Babylonians came on in and conquered Judah, carrying out the Israelites in exile and brought them back. And, and Daniel became raised essentially a captive. I don't know that calling him a slave would be the right term, but what I'll tell you this is he had no say in the positions that he filled. And he was serving the leadership of the Babylonians, and he served well. And then the Babylonian Empire ultimately, 70 years into the time there, was conquered by the Medes and Persians. And so now all of a sudden King Darius is in charge. And Darius notices the wisdom of Daniel and helps to put him in control of some stuff. There are some people who were not Israelites who didn't take kindly to that. They didn't like Daniel's faithfulness. They didn't like the way the king leaned on him and they wanted to see him punished. And so they tricked the king into passing a law that said anybody that worships somebody other than you, king, should be executed, thrown into the lion's den. And they, predictably, because Daniel was so faithful in his following of the Lord, catch Daniel praying to the Lord. They bring him before the king, and the king is given no choice but to toss Daniel into the lion's den. All Daniel has done is be faithful to the Lord no matter what the circumstances are. He has proclaimed God's word to people who had no desire to hear it, but he did it because God called him to be a faithful servant. And so here's our faithful servant, and he is tossed into the lion's den. And the next morning, King Darius goes and pulls out a very much alive Daniel. The man should have been killed, mauled, eaten. And instead, he walks right on out saying, my God protected me. It's a beautiful outcome for a man so faithful to the Lord, a man who had lived his life in exile in bondage to others, but always faithful to the Lord, proclaiming the Lord's word. A lifetime of faithful service, faced with execution, but spared by God. Boy, wouldn't it be great if that was the model that we could follow? But then if we look into the New Testament, we see John the Baptist. John born a few months prior to Jesus, a relative of Jesus, one who was born to be the forerunner to the coming Messiah, the one who would proclaim, make way, prepare yourselves, repent for the kingdom of God is near. One who would also live his life in faithful obedience to the Lord, doing as he was told to do without being swayed right or left, but always persevering faithfully to the task at hand. He is also faced with execution from a ruler who didn't really want to kill him, but given no choice because he's outsmarted as well. So you would expect Daniel is thrown into the lion's den, a faithful servant, and he walks right out. Well, here's John the Baptist, one of the greatest men ever born, says Jesus, faithful. Surely he would be spared, but he's not. His life ends. I imagine if you were to have asked John's followers at the time, how do you feel about that outcome? They're probably going to say, one guy gets out scot-free and is exalted. One guy is executed and defiled. They're both faithful to the Lord. How is that fair? How is that right? And that's sort of the mindset that was in Peter, I think. And you see, this is, it strikes at the very core of who we are as human beings. We have this tendency to determine what is right by looking around at what we see. And if we see the experiences that other people are having, and they're a lot better than ours, we tend to think that that's right and what we're going through is not right. Now, here's the funny thing. If our experience is really good compared to what everybody else is going through, our experience is one that's fair. It's the way that works. We tend to believe that whatever is the most favorable outcome is the fair and right outcome that we deserve. And it gets really challenging, especially when we're looking at things from a biblical perspective. Because John the Baptist was faithful to God's call, and he was executed. 
Daniel was faithful to God's call, and he was exalted as a wise ruler. In both instances, men devoted to faithfully following the word of God with very different outcomes in this world. Don't lose sight of the fact that Jesus, in responding to the plight of Peter, says, follow me. The very same words that invited him to come into ministry with him three and a half years earlier. Follow me. That's what Jesus wants from us. Follow me. Because when we follow him, we have to then realize that his call for my life is different than his call on your life or on your life. Because what he has called us to do is unique in each and every instance. And how it turns out is completely in his hands. Or more precisely, as he says to us, if I wanted to remain alive until then, what is it to you? Well, it becomes important to us when we stop thinking in the eternal and focus on the material. If we start thinking that all we really have is what is around us materially, then we get really concerned if we don't have it as good as somebody else. What that means is that we don't understand that the real riches that we get to experience don't begin until we die and are ushered into the presence of God and his kingdom. That's where real living begins. And everything that we're doing up till that point, well, one, it's going to pass in the blink of an eye. But two, it doesn't really matter. One suffers, one's blessed. One has riches, one has little. One loses a child. The other has a beautiful family that's healthy. The reality is, in all of those instances, God is at work using us, if we will but follow him through those times, to glorify him. We have been placed in the circumstances that we've been placed in so that we can walk the walk that God called us to walk. So that we can bring him glory wherever we are. But we get caught up in whether or not things are fair whether or not things are right, whether or not somebody else has something better than we do. <clears throat> and that really, if you think about it, gets to the heart of the 10th commandment, doesn't it? Thou shalt not covet. If you want to be more specific about it, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, his ox or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You shall not covet his long life. You shall not covet his comfort and ease. You shall not covet any part of it. Because I'm the Lord God and I gave you all that you need. And when you've set your eyes upon coveting what somebody else has, you're not loving them. Never lose sight of the fact that when Jesus was asked, what is the first and greatest commandment? He said, the first and greatest is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength. And then he very quickly said, the second is this, to love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said words we must never forget. All of the other laws hang on these two. And what do those two have as the arms to hang from? Love. If we're coveting, we're not loving. If we are saying about somebody else versus our predicament, that's not fair, that's not love. We must learn to be content with what we have, which brings me to another of our wonderful sages, another one of our great apostles, another one of our saints, Paul. Paul said this, he says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. 
Paul understood that it is only when we are content with whatever God has provided us with that we can truly act as God has called us to act. With gratitude for what we have, with hope for what he will provide, with thanks for what he has already given us through his son, and in obedience to his call to follow him wherever that journey takes us. Ultimately, whether or not we love the Lord God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength is not played out by whether we come into church. It's not played out by whether we can recite the words of any particular gospel, the whole book, a chapter, even a few verses. It's not about whether or not we're willing to pray. What determines whether or not we are followers of Christ is if we are following him and walking with joy and gladness in our heart to wherever he sends us, doing whatever he calls us to do. If we're not being obedient to him, we're not following him. Jesus says, follow me. I told Catherine that this was going to be the topic of my sermon this week. She said, Dad, my last Sunday in church, and this is what you're going to preach on? <laughs> All right, a little preacher license, but it wasn't far off from that. She was surprised that this would be the message that I would impart on her as she is departing. But it's so critical for all of us because following Christ is not easy. In a world that is opposed to all that Christ stands for, there will be so many things trying to divert us to the right, to the left, trying to stop us, trying to sink us trying to lure us to a different direction. And it's really easy, especially in this day and age where we are being bombarded left and right with how life should be. All of these wonderful things that you should have in your life, all of these blessings, the material prosperity, the great experiences. Our society is really good at telling you the way life should be. And in none of that, are the words of Jesus, follow me. And none of that is the expectation that life is going to be hard. Just surrender to the guidance of Christ. That's not the message that the world is sending. And so as you are heading off to experience life as an adult, doing what you see fit, understand that the way to navigate the waters is to follow him. And when the world tries to pull you in some other direction, follow him. And when that innate part of you that says, I want what they've got. Realize that Christ has given you all that you need and be content to be the person that he called you to be. I can't think of a more important message to give you as you are heading off to become who you were meant to be than to tell you, follow the one who made you who you were meant to be. Follow him and rejoice in that because there's no greater person that you can be. I want to close with these words that Paul wrote to Timothy. He said this. These are the things you are to teach and insist on. If anyone teaches otherwise, do not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching. They are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God who gives life to everything, 
and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Father, Lord, there is no way but yours for people who would call themselves by your name. And Father, it takes strength and courage, peace and resolve to walk after you in these troubled times. And we can't do it lest we be led by your Holy Spirit. So Father, help us to still our own voices. Help us to deny ourselves. Help us to learn to be content in all that you have blessed us with because, Father, you have so richly blessed us. And, Lord, give us the strength to follow you because we wish to bring you honor, glory, and praise. We wish to live the life that you have created us for regardless of what the world says we should do. So guide us and direct us, Lord. Make us complete in you, and may that bring us such great joy in our hearts that we would desire nothing else than to walk with you daily. We thank you for your love, Father. We thank you for your sacrifice upon the cross. We thank you for your blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins so that we could be reconciled with you. And Lord, may your peace that passes all understanding calm us and guide us. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, church, we're just about done. However, as you picked up from a prayer request and from part of this message, there is one who has been a part of this church for 17 years who is about to embark on the next phase in life. Catherine, would you come down here, please? <laughs> Some of you have been here for 17 years and remember her as this little 18-month-old kid who would sit back there and occasionally cause us to have to leave the service for a moment or two. Some of you have come into her lives more recently and seen her as this beautiful young woman who's about to head off. But for all who are baptized with the Holy Spirit, you are her family. And so I would like to say a blessing now over Catherine as we send her off. But I'd like to invite any of you who feel so led to come on up and be a part of this. Because this is a big moment. This isn't just a mom and dad moment. This is a church family moment. So if you'd like to, you're welcome to come on up and pray with us. If you'd like to just do so from there, you're welcome to do that as well. I know Catherine feels your hugs from wherever you are. But I just want to send this young lady off knowing that she is loved and that she is going with God's will. Father, Lord, I thank you so much for Catherine. I thank you so much that she has been a part of this church for 17 years. I thank you that we had the awesome privilege of baptizing her here, of seeing her grow in her faith in you. Lord, what a beautiful place to establish foundations from which to build a life. And so, Lord, I pray not just as her father, not just as her pastor, but as a co-family member in an eternal family united through the bonds of your son, Jesus Christ. I pray that as she prepares for this next phase in her life, Lord, that she would go with your blessing, that she would go with your protection, that she would go with this knowledge that at any moment that she needs you, she need but cry out to you, and you would be there. Lord, guide her steps. Use her and her knowledge of you and her relationship with you to soften the hearts of others and lead them to know you as well. But always, Father, help her to follow your steps, whatever they may be in her life. For you have called us to be faithful to you. And so I pray that you would just help Catherine to do that. 
Help her to be content with the many blessings you've already poured out on her. At the same time, continuing to strive forward, knowing that a crown of thorns has been put on your head, Lord, so that we can all wear a crown of glory in your presence when we run the race that you have given us to run. We thank you, Father, for your son. And Father, we thank you for this daughter's life. Bless her and protect her. Keep her and use her to your glory, for she is yours. And we thank you, Father, and we praise you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we have a closing hymn. Yeah. We're going to close with number 349, Trust and Obey. Please stand when you have it, 349. benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit rest, abide, and remain in each and every one of you. And in so doing, may he grant you that amazing capacity to go forth from here to truly love your neighbor as yourself. And the church all said, Amen. Amen. you have entered to worship, depart to serve, and may you all have a blessed week. Okay.